Can I pray for us as we start? Father God, thank you that you will hold us fast. Thank you that we can trust you. Thank you that in the midst of suffering, there is hope. I pray that uh, my words tonight would not be my own, but would be yours. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, that each assembled here would know more of you through the words of this precious psalm that we're going to spend some time in. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. What do you do if you are suffering and you feel that God is distant? At school, we've just conducted our interviews for the senior prefect team. When we announced the successful applicants, we watched the faces of the unsuccessful students. They were variously crestfallen or grumpy or stoic. A few of them had rictus smiles painted across their faces to try and maintain composure and quite commendably to stop other people from feeling uncomfortable, uh, ruining the moment for the successful students. Some of the unsuccessful students came to see me for feedback on their interviews afterwards. Why not me? They wondered. That was in a small way, a very small way, the suffering of being overlooked, of being forsaken. Obviously, I told them they just weren't good enough, you know, and uh, <coughs> try better next time. I wonder how the families of those killed in Christchurch, New Zealand, um, felt after those events on March the 15th. Those Muslim communities in the anguish of bereavement, may well have known an emptiness, a lack where a presence should have been, a sense of being singled out for suffering. Likewise, the attacks on Christians by Islamic militants in Nigeria only a few days earlier than that, which received considerably less press coverage, would also have left those families thinking, where was the protection? Where is the recognition of this atrocity by the rest of the world? Where are you, God, in all this? Conditions of ill health are also apt to raise questions about the whereabouts of a good God. There are several clear images in the psalm we're looking at to indicate a poor state of health on the part of David, the psalmist. I am a worm and not a man, he says at one point. My bones are all out of joint. My strength is dried up like a pot surd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. One uh, wheelchair-bound student at my school consistently hated her RE lessons for the simple reason that being reminded of God reminded her of what he had not given her. She felt forsaken. Well, I hope your Bibles are still open. If they're not, you might want to get them to Psalm 22 around this point. If you need to get one from the back, feel free to do so. Um, it's useful to be able to have a look at the, the text that we're reading um, this evening. And we're going to be thinking, as I said, about those questions at the start. What do you do? And linking in with your recent uh, set of services, how do you pray if you are suffering and you feel like God is distant. There are many places in the Bible that can help with questions like these. We know the book of Job, Jeremiah chapter 20, Ecclesiastes, there are lots of other Psalms as well, not to mention all those passages that reflect on the passion of Jesus. But we're going to examine this evening how David does it in this particular Psalm. In short, I'm not going to solve the problem of suffering this evening, but I'll try and use the, the time to expound this psalm to help us with one approach to suffering and what to do when we feel the absence of God. So if you're looking at the psalm now, you might be able to see that we can lay it out a bit like this. We've got uh, approximately, well, I guess six sections that I've highlighted here, going from verses one through to the end. It begins... David begins, doesn't he, lamenting the absence of God. The uh, 16th century mystic 
Saint John of the Cross spoke about a dark night of the soul. And uh, he said this, I'll come back to this layout in a moment because it's helpful. But St. John of the Cross said, said this, or will I? Yeah, yeah, he said this. The soul feels itself so far from being favoured that it thinks that even that wherein it was wont to find some help has vanished with everything else and that there is none who has pity upon it. That plea for God's help and therefore his presence appears again in verse 12 of our psalm. But it is both of those things, isn't it? It's the feeling of being unable to manage technology. <laughs> it's going back. There we are. Yeah. It's the feeling of being, uh, 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 having God absent from you combined with suffering. We get the various descriptions of suffering through the first two thirds of Psalm 22. It's not only bodily suffering, but emotional too. While David's physical anguish goes on, he's taunted by mockers. He says, I'm scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Trouble is near and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. But you notice then something different happening in the middle of verse 21. If you look there, David says, save me from the mouth of the lion. Then straight after it, you have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. What was a plea becomes grateful praise. And the rest of the psalm continues in a quite new vein thanking God and giving him glory. Well, that's a very quick, in some ways sketchy overview, just to point out how this very famous psalm is laid out for us. Can it teach us how to respond when we're suffering? I've already said that there's no chance of me being able to speak to every single problem of suffering in the room uh, this evening. But that this psalm has things to teach us about the management of suffering, how to bring it before the Lord, is not in doubt. So let's have a look and see if we can be helped by it. I'm going to do this in the time-honoured fashion of having three takeaway points. So the first one I think popped up a little while ago. Let's see if we can get it here again. Um, that's right. Don't let your circumstances obscure your theology or less helpfully but a bit more snappily don't let feelings obscure facts there is no point in David saying anything if he doesn't believe there's a God there to hear him in our suffering do we seek God or do we seek revenge against God for putting us through it Are we longing for our shepherd to find us or are we trying to emotionally blackmail him into admitting he was wrong for allowing our suffering? The fact that David is seeking his shepherd is, of course, seen in his very next and very famous psalm, Psalm 23. We see in the first verse of our present psalm, though, that tension. David calls out, my God, showing that he belongs to God, even in his pain, before asking, why have you forsaken me? Showing how overwhelming that pain is. Can you see that those two things are both there? But if he had really let the pain overwhelm him, he wouldn't have been calling out at all. The great reformer uh, John Calvin puts it like this, the people of God in wrestling with themselves, on the one hand discover the weakness of the flesh, and on the other give evidence of their faith. The alternative, he says, is that people cherish in their hearts their distrust of God. 
the alternative notice isn't that people doubt or that they experience anger or get upset or are tearful or feel overwhelmed by grief. The alternative is that they cherish in their hearts their distrust of God and do not even call out to him. Such people are letting their circumstances obscure their knowledge of God and his promises. And that is not a way out of suffering. It is a way even further into it. So the first thing, don't let your circumstances obscure your theology. Secondly, the community is here to support you. Now, how do I get this from Psalm 22? From either end is the answer. It's usual to gloss over the superscriptions at the start of Psalms. That's the little bit before you even get to verse 1. In this case, it says, if you look again at your Bibles, to the choir master, according to the doe of the dawn, a psalm of David. And of course, that's partly how we know that this is a psalm that was written by David. But the person to whom the psalm is directed is not just any old choir master. The word here carries a note of triumph or victory. So it's the kind of choir master that would have presided over a victory march, something like that. And the mention of the dawn in that song titled To the Day of the Dawn was understood by the earliest Jewish interpreters as carrying the promise of hope coming with the light. So even before the psalm begins, we are expecting a happy ending. This was a song sung by the Jewish community celebrating one individual's deliverance by God. The fact that the suffering is so existential and acute at the start serves to highlight the sincerity of feeling at the end. The gratitude to the God who brings deliverance out of despair. I wonder how many of us here this evening have been encouraged by brothers and sisters, even in this room, who have walked painfully through trials, been delivered by the Lord, and then been able to walk alongside us as we suffer in similar ways, or even in different ways. There's no balm for the Christian soul quite like that of a brother or sister who has been there too. Their deliverance is cause for celebration in the community, and it can be a source of comfort and hope for you. This too is illustrated in Psalm 22. So don't let your circumstances obscure your theology and be prepared to accept support from the community. Thirdly, be honest about your struggle like Jesus was. Psalm 22 is made more significant for Christians because of Jesus' words from the cross. Verse 1, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, is of course quoted by Jesus uh, in Mark 15 and in Matthew 27. And this of course is interesting in its own right. We can ask, what does it mean that Jesus used Psalm 22 at the hour of his death? How can this encourage us in our faith? Just quickly, it's worth pointing out that there is a theological consideration to have here as well. Because lots of people have argued that when Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is because he actually had been abandoned by the Father. Or perhaps he'd been deceived into believing this. But it's unlikely that when Matthew and Mark place these words in the mouth of Jesus, that they're trying to say that. That, of course, would mean if Jesus had actually been separated um, from the Father in a real sense, that the union of the Trinitarian Godhead would have been temporarily dissolved, which has huge theological consequences. And, of course, if Jesus were truly rejected by God here, it would actually be quite strange for Mark to have the Roman centurion declare five verses later that Jesus was the son of God. So it seems that that's probably not what the gospel authors were trying to say in having these words in Jesus's mouth. So what am I saying then? Is Jesus on the cross making up his sense of abandonment? No. Then why does Jesus's use of Psalm 22 verse 1 arise? 
My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, firstly, because he didn't only seem to be human. He was fully human. And he was experiencing an agonising death. To deny this is to contradict scripture. Peter says as much in Acts 2.24. And secondly, because sin separates all humans from God, it was necessary here that Jesus was to appear before the judgment seat of God as a sinner. Let me be clear. In Jesus himself, there was no sin. Hebrews 4 tells us that. But we also know that the crucial factor in our reconciliation to God was that, in Paul's words, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. On the cross, Jesus' taking of our sin is his first experience, humanly speaking, of that separation from the Father that we must sadly take for granted by virtue of our sinful humanity. But it is always in Jesus that our hope resides. We see our Lord on the cross, in pain, holding the weight of his shoulders on his arms and the weight of our sin on his shoulders. Why does he quote this psalm? Because he knows it's ending. His task is no less painful and his suffering is no less acute for the knowledge that his separation from the Father, bearing our sin, is the only way to bring his fragile creation back to those same pierced arms. Yet that is the truth. He trusts in the truth. My God, he says, not in his circumstances. He knows that this act, in the cold dark of Good Friday, is the beginning of the end for death, decay, pain and loneliness. He knows that by this suffering, he will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things will be gone forever. I don't think that I'm very good at remembering any of these things when I'm suffering, even a bit. I often forget to focus on the truth of my Saviour's love for me. I choose self-pity, sometimes to the point of petulance. I forget that my King has given me a church family with whom I can share my suffering. Out of embarrassment, I don't share my vulnerability. I'm also trying harder, of course, as my Saviour did, to have hope without denying the horror. There's one major difference between David's experience in the original setting of Psalm 22 and Jesus' deeper knowledge of the same words as he breathes those words, those other words from the cross. It is finished. David is apparently halfway through Psalm 22 or two-thirds of the way through Psalm 22. David is delivered from death. That's explaining the happier ending of the psalm. For Jesus, it's a deliverance through death. And his deliverance, we remember as we approach Easter, is also ours. Listen again then to these words. As you gaze upon the face of the dying maker of all things. At this point, where he experienced the loneliness of having no one beside him so that you could always know him beside you in your loneliness. He will wipe away every tear from your eye. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship, all who go down to the dust will kneel before him, those who cannot keep themselves alive. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness 
declaring to a people yet unborn, He has done it.